As I say, the years go by, and you do forget all about these things until such occasions somebody says, well, do you remember? And you f you're surprised then at just how much you can. Light and space, that was what Bellman meant to me when I first moved out. But coming into a place like town was absolutely fantastic. It was coming into a new world. It was a very pretty rural country. place. Real, no pavement. Can you imagine no pavement? Nothing. No roads. No roads were built. I was 10 and to me it was heaven. Beautiful fields and I really enjoyed every minute of it. Well I was only a very little girl. I mean, uh, at Downham, I mean, I, it's all been said before, it was paradise. Now when we came here, it was very utopian. Buttercups growing everywhere. No roads, of course, it was quite muddy. Little railway running through for the workmen. Um, fields, grass, just, just plain, not a care in the world. And in fact, you know, I can only look back with, with happiness and relaxation, and yet it really as point of view of my car that was unemployed 90% of the time, it could not have been a happy time for them. But I can only look back with great happiness. To me, Downham was space and light because we lived at Deptford and there was a huge wall at the back of, you know, the back of the house. And to, as, as Vera said, to come out to Downham was like coming to paradise. The roads were all clean cut. And uh, at night, when it was dark, it really was dark because there was no street lighting. And uh, we went up to bed in the dark. There was no light for you. They never lit the gas for you to go up. You went up in the dark and you felt your way to bed. <laughs> and um, well, it, was it was just a matter of the space and the light and the fields. To walk, when you see these adverts for certain soap, and shampoos in the television, you see somebody walk buttercups and days. That's what we did That's up it. to our necks, didn't we? Yes. In buttercups and days. very young of course I was about seven years old and I can vi just remember driving along on this bus through Catford and places like that and it gradually became more countryfied because as far as I was concerned at that time Lewisham clock tower at Lewisham was the hub of the world I didn't know where any anywhere else mm. and then we arrived at the bottom of eventually at the bottom of Bromley Hill and it was all very rural and countryfied. Well, I only had two rooms at Deptford. In the, like, it was a three-storey house in Reginald Road, Deptford. And uh, the landlady, she wanted the rooms for her daughter, so 
I, we wrote to the council and they give us that in Lentmead Road, number 13. Well, Deptford um, is part of London's slum area, as it was, and the house that I lived in at, uh, at there was a, a flat, a basement flat. There were seven people living in that house, and it was a squidgy little place. No hot water, no baths. Friday night was a, you know, pull the bath out from under the, you know, the sort of under the landing sort of thing and bath in it. Uh, it was a concrete jungle. There was no greenery around there. Miles from any parks. And we just played in the street as children, you know. There was a lot of poverty around those days. And, you know, a lot of people were out of work. But as a community, we did try to help one another then, you know, in, in that area. I was born in the house I'm living in now, in Fieldside Road. But my parents and my brother and sister, who were seven and five respectively, they came from Hammersmith and they'd lived in Hughes Flats, to my knowledge. I think it was alive with rats or something or the other. And of course, when my mother came, to think that there was actually a toilet, a flush toilet, plus a bath, I mean, that was Buckingham Palace to my mother and my father. He'd always lived previous to that in Peckham. And to him, it was just paradise. There was the fields, and there were plenty of those, and there was the trees, and a garden of all things. So that, and I mean, there was a freedom from a brother and sister being able to play in a garden instead of being cooped up in rooms. Well, when we first got into the house, to go it new a house with a indoor bathroom, indoor toilet, and walk straight out in the garden was marvellous as far as we was concerned, because you've never seen, I mean, if you know uh, the elephant, there's no fields around there or anything. And the opposite side of the road to us, the houses weren't built then, so Durham Hill was just one big open space. We, we came from the East End, I mean, my, my father got just on the sun during the war, and he was always in hospital, and the doctors decided that the air for endowment was ideal for his condition. So that's why we came from the East End. And I always remember, uh, my, my father was actually in hospital the hospital when I came, when we came here. And I came with my mother to view the house, and we walked up down and way, and, and, and the place looked so vast, the road was so vast, and clean, the cleanliness, compared to the East End, you know, it, it hit, I, I mean, I, my life had already started being formed. I was old enough to, to know about the East End, and, and the impressions was always stuck in my mind how clean the houses were and how big the roads were and, and beautiful. Well, the houses were very bare, and um, the walls were awful, all distempered, with this horrible beige colour, and all the paint everywhere. Um, very cold when we moved in, wasn't it? Trying to think what else there was. I didn't like it at all. No wallpaper. Nothing there. Well, it was very basic, but on the whole, I, I liked it. I thought it was all lovely there. I really enjoyed it all. But uh, I was different, you know. I was at school, and to me, going there with all my friends was... I thought it was really lovely. The house, we had rough stone floors in the kitchen. I can remember that, because that was one of my jobs, scrubbing it. Yeah, yeah, got that job. And... Uh, other than that, no, I, you would probably remember a bit more than me, but I, I, I liked it. I really thought it was all nice and bare and clean and, uh, you know, I really liked it. Well, we, we were in a five, what they called a five-roomed house. That was three bedrooms upstairs, a toilet and bathroom, and we had parlour type, and that was um, two, two rooms, and there was what we call folding doors. So, because when we first moved in there, that was lovely plenty of room but once mum and dad got settled and there was furniture bought for the what we called the parlour in those days didn't we of course that wasn't that room was never used only except for christmas or funerals, funerals. <laughs> <laughs> and a very tiny kitchen that had um the stove stove was next opposite the um sink so if your mum and dad were there nobody else could get by and that had the um coal cellar was under the stairs. That that was in the kitchen. Of course, every time the coal was delivered, everything got covered with coal yeah, dust. Yeah, and there was yeah. um, the copper with the fire under it in the kitchen. And oh, there was a pump above this, which pumped up into the bathroom upstairs. Um, 
sometimes it would go, uh, sometimes you'd have to put some water in into the pipe for it to pump up. And of course, if the uh, pump went wrong, which happened very often, you carted up the buckets of water oh, upstairs, upstairs and you had to be very careful you didn't burn yourself. Mm. And um, of course, there was a bath which was absolutely smashing, wasn't it? Oh, so oh, had the bath oh, and an indoor toilet. <coughs> that was lovely. Conditions of tenancy. The tenants shall not drive nails or allow or lay linoleum on any wooden floor within one foot keep on the premises wall. or any part thereof any pigs rabbits fowls or pigeons erect or permit to be erected any wireless aerial or make any the tenant shall clean the windows of the premises at garden the gates should not be slammed in a careless manner children should be instructed not to neglect swing of on. the garden spoils Rashes the appearance off. of any house it is of special importance. The tenant shall not, without the previous written permission of the council. There was quite a, um, um, a set of rules which you had to abide by when you first came in. Yes, there were. But the council people always helped you out um, because they used to cut, cut, you know, after the privets decided to go, they always came along and cut the privets for you. Or if you were elderly or couldn't have it, they would always come and help you. And the houses were always... Um, well decorated. You know what I mean? They looked after the council looked after them, and they expected you to look after them too. You used to get uh, people coming around from the actual council itself, and if your garden wasn't tidy, they used to come and tell you, and you had, they used to say, "Get it tidy by a certain time," and you had to do it. And um, that was your own garden. You weren't allowed to touch the privets or anything because that was done by council itself uh, and that was the same with your back garden you should come around and if your back garden wasn't tidy you should get told about it uh, you weren't allowed to paint the house you had their colors <coughs> which is either your paintwork was either white cream or brown whichever you you had a choice of that uh, they, they didn't sort of write your letters they just used to knock at your door and say uh, you get your garden tidied up and you had to do it. When we first moved to Amsterdam, we had inspectors every so often to come to see if you're keeping the place clean. And people would, you know, there'd be in some road, perhaps the next road, and the world would go around, <laughs> the inspectors would <laughs> come in. And all the mums would, you know. But I think on the whole we were clean people. It was a general consensus opinion of better off people that we were not really civilised, right? Yeah. Don't forget we hadn't had universal education for long. So there was a great reactionary group in this country that didn't realise that people like us, till, until the war, had any talent at all, until they called us up and put us in the forces. <laughs> I was 14 there was no job for me so my father said no job then you don't leave school and we had special permission for me to stay on at school until a job was found well he was dead keen my father that we took a trade he thought it was essential and he wanted me to go in the print and I then stayed on at school until a job in the print was found because the print then was the same as it is now, it was a closed shop. Many of my friends that I chummed up with at school, their fathers were hod carriers and bricklayers and there was a lot of it going on on the estate, naturally, tilers, a lot of work, but as the school days came to an end and we drifted to different places, a lot of us went, had to go up to London I was very fortunate, I used to go into Bromley and my first week's wages was 50 pence or 10 shillings and my father advanced me the money to buy a Hercules bicycle that I could go to work on. It would have cost me on the bus tuppence but he bought me this bike. I think a very important thing that should be remembered which makes some comparison to today is the number of young lads that left school at 14 took jobs either as errand boys for shops because you said the dads come around on the bikes delivering or van boys and at 16 they were out of work. 
They were just taken on part time for that couple of years, and soon I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe at about 16 they become eligible to them for some kind of insurance. Uh, insurance. And they were out, and it was another load. I make, I make the comparison much like we've got the training schemes today, which put a lad in for 12 months, and yeah, it wasn't so different except no one gave them. They had to find those, sort of, but they were always there because they constantly cycled round every two years because none of the, these firms, the van boys that used to ride on the backs of the vans delivering, the boys that used to, to I'd done when I first left school, rode a bike delivering around in Shortlands, and masses of small jobs like that. Something most peculiar happened when the war started. All these youngsters that were unemployed and all these people were suddenly found that they'd got far more intelligence than the authorities had given them credit for. And they became pilots, mm. they became officers in the Navy, the women went into the services, and we, some of the cream of this country, came off the council estates and went into the services. And I think that was the biggest revelation to me of what it means to be a working class person. As the roads were built up, you had them, mm. the men came, you have a greengrocer came round with a horse and mm. cart, yeah, yeah. and um, then there was a salt and vinegar man came round, <laughs> and with the great blocks of salt, salt. which he cut off, and he would sell the um, white hearthstone, because some people still white their, you know, their fires, the hearthstone, and um, then there was the um, Muffin Man every Saturday, the Shrimp and Weevil Man. man. Yes, the cat's meat man, he came twice a week, yes, didn't he? And that yes. was the, you know, the horse flesh cut up with the, um, then we had a, um, uh, before the light at Downham Library was built, we had a, a chap came round with um, like books, books, with library books, mm -hmm. and my brother told me the other night that he also used this tripe for selling hot pies in the evening. But I don't remember this, because he d you remember this, and he used the trike during the day for, you know, for the books, which were twopence a week. Yeah. You borrowed them for twopence a week. Can you just tell me anything anyone remembers about going down to what is now Kay's? Kay's? What, the diaper shop? Mm. Oh, yes. But she didn't have a shop at first. No. There was somebody else that had a shop there at first. Yeah. Mm. Oh. yeah, you always went to yeah. Kay's for your wool yes. when you were um, yeah. knitting for the youngsters. I, well, in fact, I still go around, always go to Kay's, don't mm. I, for my wool. You're the same type of shawl. I can, no, I can remember my mother buying crochet cotton from down there because when Dad was out of work, she'd crochet little berets and things like that, take them back to the shop and they would sell them in there. Well, it was already um, uh, drapers before I came here, owned by two old ladies and one was 86 and the other one was 78 and they retired and I thought well I'd like to take the shop over as I've liked shop work so much so of course I came in here and been here ever since. There was quite a lot of trade about earlier it's because uh, with the big stores opening now it has dropped off a lot now where we used to sell just give out babies clothes all day like handbills is hardly anything sold in baby season now because all the big stores have taken over you know like Woolworths and Boots and all that and it's surprising now it's dropped off now well you say that you see they say there's not no profit in them that's why they won't do it well there was one experience I had last year was um, uh, two or three people came from um, Australia and uh, a lady stood in the middle of the shop she said oh isn't it a lovely shop she said you don't see shops like this anymore she said it's just like Aladdin's cave in here <laughs> <laughs> yeah. lots and lots of people so wasn't it lovely to come into a shop like this you know an old-fashioned shop where you can get what you want because they they say we even go in the big stores and can't get anything in there but we come to you and you've got everything we want Got boxes of buttons and dolls. Yeah. Like you. Never got enough. <laughs> never, <laughs> never got the right colours I want. That's the trouble, oh, Dolly. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. They come from all over the globe here. And um, old people, you see, for their very old clothes, they can't get them anywhere. The big stores don't stop them. And I've had two or three come in here and ask me, and I said, Yes, madam. And they've stood and cried because they've just been everywhere, even up London, and can't get them. So that's why they don't want me to go. <laughs>
feel very sad retiring, yes. And all the customers will, because that's all I get all day. Oh, don't leave us, Kay, don't leave us, Kay. What are we going to do if you go? <laughs> don't we, Vi? Mm, they want me to go, but they know. In the area, as a youngster, you know, coming from a condition where I was cramped and restricted as a child because I couldn't go out on my own feet, <coughs> came up here and, and um, you know, we just went wild. Um, we used to ask our mother for um, some sandwiches or something. We used to go out and play at the fields all day and come back and it was absolutely heaven to us, you know. Football, cricket, and anything like that. And my parents bought me a pair of skates at one time, which was, you know, really something. I used to skate all over down them with my skates, you know. It was exciting. Life was, life was really tremendous. Weekends, you'd come out, a packet of sandwiches in your pocket and a bottle of lemonade out in the woods when you was there all day. But I mean, you used to get the usual tricks, climbing trees and God only knows what. And at the bottom of Down and Way now, which used to be Old Rolling Road, that used to be all marshlands. And uh, you used to go down there and you'd float logs on it. You used to get on there and float all around, chasing one another all over the islands and go scrumping because there used to be uh, quite a few uh, orchards around this area. Um, winter evenings would be things like Lugo or Domino's. Not darts because you had gas and mantles cost a penny each and they were very, very fragile. <laughs> so, and your parents joined in with that kind of thing. Yes, I mean, we did a bit, a bit of knitting, but it was never taken seriously. Again, you could, your parents couldn't afford to go out buying wool. I mean, that was a luxury. During the winter nights, you could, uh, we used to do it. You used to go up on the Durham Hill, sit on the top, and you could see into the old Crystal Palace. There was nothing in your way. And you, you sit up there every Thursday night and watch a fireworks display. Uh, if you looked at Durham Hill then, like the uh, right hand side, the biggest part of it, <coughs> where the uh, swimming pool is now, you used to get six or seven hundred people sitting up there. Just sitting there watching the fireworks. Because you, you more or less see every firework they had from the top of the hill at the time. She had no stuff in the way, no buildings or nothing. As we grow up, you know, the Downham Tavern was built. And in itself, the Downham Tavern was a remarkable thing because it was the, it was the largest tavern in England at its time. They used to have shows over there, which, you know, m me as a youngster was just unbelievable. They used to have flower shows and bird shows and all sorts of things. And they had vaudeville on the Sunday night. I mean, that alone, you know, to people from our background was absolutely fantastic. It was a real paradox. Oh yes, uh, I used to go, when I used to go in my house, and they had concerts up there, you know, um, amateurs getting up on the stage and singing, they was quite good singers, it was really lovely on a Sunday night and Saturday night, but that all finished a long while ago now. They had a hall next to the tavern. It was quite a nice hall. It was like going into a cinema, actually, and there was a small round, uh, I don't know the name. Uh, box office. Box office, which you uh, went to and paid your money to go in, and it only cost two and a half pence, six pence, to go into this dance. And with that ticket, you were allowed to buy a drink. I had dancing from late to eleven, old time dancing on Monday night. There was an old chap named Mr. Annette who used to run these dances. The band was up on a big stage and they played all sorts of dances from waltzes to uh, Canadian barn dances and London tango and all sorts of old time dances. Then on Tuesday night it was modern dancing, same price to go in. And you didn't buy any drinks at the bar, and as waiters used to run around and serve you. My dad, as I told you before, he did a lot of the scaffolding on this place. But you can imagine, I don't know if the film, film can pick up the roof and the ceiling, 
can you imagine what a wonderful pose it was on a council estate? It's unbelievable. Oh. It was so beautiful and clean. Really, really lovely. lovely place. Spanish concert hall. Yeah. Mm. in England. Thank you. It's a terrible disappointment to see yes, it yes, it it is. Really <laughs> lovely. When I used to come, there was um, French doors that looked out onto beautiful rose gardens here. It's the um, car park now, and they had lovely red velvet curtains. And on a Saturday evening, when in the summer when the doors were open, you used to really think it was a film star, you know, wandering out into the rose garden and. Uh, it was absolutely beautiful. To me, this is terribly sad. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it for years, and it really is a great pity. Aesthetic. It mm. is, yeah. Well, when I used to come up here, I used to come with my parents, and because um, I was only young, so we used to go in the tea rooms, which were next door here, and um, you know, sit there in the evening while they came into the concerts in here on Saturdays and Sundays. They used to come to concerts. So it was very nice. All, it? All, all, the all the children. children. It's full of children and yeah. they just all enjoy the evenings. Yeah. Yeah. And as I told before, all these walls were insulated mm. with seaweed, really packed tight, sort of for the convenience of the neighbours, otherwise it would have been very noisy. Mm. Of course it was very noisy at times here, mm. wasn't it? Especially mm. at Christmas time and when you've got a talent contest and somebody built now, it's a sin to tell a lie. <laughs> or the or wrestling. The yeah, or, or the, the greatest, wrestling. <laughs> or the greatest mistake of my life and all those kind of songs. You sang up here, didn't you? Well, I used to sing with a band, with the Rainbow Rhythm Band. And, oh, it was marvellous. It really was. It always packed. Um, what sort of songs? Oh, I used to sing all Dorothy Squire's numbers, Gypsy, Tree in the Meadow. Nancy with a laughing face, all those sort of numbers, you know, all the slow ballad ones. Um, two years, till I was about 17, I was 15 then, till I was about 17. I used to go around with the band to other places, but yes, t <laughs> 25p <laughs> a night. It's a lot of money there in those Oh, it days. was. The band only used to get 35 shillings, you know, each. It was excellent bands. I mean, the musicians were really terrific, you mm. know, they really were. But it was non-stop dance, and there were two bands then when it started off. And of course, when you came out Saturday nights, as we invariably did, you spent all day Saturday in your curlers, mm, yeah. and never <laughs> took yeah, them out that, until that, the last right. minute, because we didn't right. go to the hairdressers no, then, no, like no, we do no, today. You you, everybody wore their curlers right. all, all day, day Saturday, <laughs> so they looked the best Saturday evening. Right. It was the night of the week. And you were treated. Oh, you, mm. you, you would have been a million yeah. dollars yeah. here yeah. on a you Saturday night. You bought a ticket, night. and you yes, were yes. somebody for mm. that evening, weren't you? Very classy. It was very a classy, classy pub, wasn't very it? Classy. In fact, people yeah. thought it was too good for real yes. people. Yeah. That's the truth, isn't mm. it? Mm. They thought it was a bit too, very you know, for working people. I should say about 1929 to 30, they built this cinema quite close to Downham on what was known as, what we knew as Perry's Farm. And uh, it was quite an elaborate cinema for those days. I can remember starting off from Saturday afternoon almost, you'd always see a long queue outside. And once the film had started, the people used to line up for the second house. And uh, occasionally the commissioner would come out and say, room for two inside or room for three in the balcony. and you'd go in by dribs and drabs and hope you could get in before the last hour started. Oh, down at the Splendid that we used to take, when I only had the three boys, we used to go, my husband and I, Friday night, and uh, we only paid half a crown with one on me lap and two in the night. So we used to have a penny bag of peanuts and a uh, bar of chocolate and Harry enjoyed that Friday night down the Splendid. The entrance would have been here with three doors and a flight of steps, about eight, nine or ten steps in marble and a big vestibule and the manager always used to stand in the vestibule at the start, at the second house, which was about half past seven for the customers to come in. The cash box was on that side and the carpet, I remember, 
and the flight of stairs each side was all in red, red patterns because it, you know, every for for you, for sake of practicality, and the the um there was a, I think there was about it's hard to say how many seats there were, but uh, it was a two blocks of seats and a gangway in between for fire precautions and a very big stage and um what was it like inside oh lovely really lovely it, the walls as rose said was like a castle and the ceiling terrific with moon stars really lovely really beautiful place it, the the walls were hand painted and it was a vast expanse i mean it was a huge place yeah. and each side of the cinema was painted to represent um more, in retrospect, I can imagine it more like a Wagner opera. It was an old castle and grounds and cypresses and ornamental That's lakes right, yeah. and statues and fountains. It was a riot of colour. I can see it. A riot of colour. Okay. I can see those paintings I now that I, she's talking about. I can see those paintings yeah. on the walls. And sometimes when the picture was, oh, you was a kid and you were fidgety, Sometimes I looked at those paintings more than I looked at the picture. Here I saw Gold Diggers of 1932 and films like that that are classics now. Uh, most of them were black and white and when The Wizard of Oz came along, which was done in colour, really good colour, it was a revelation, you know. And uh, You used to work here? Yes, I worked here. I worked here as an usherette, a cigarette, ice cream and eventually went into the operating when the war came and the, the boys went away and the men went away we had to man the operating uh, side of things which I didn't like. I first remember the splendid video was when I was five as I say being dressed all in this this paper and someone pushing me on the stage and saying sing and I started singing and then they whipped the mic away of course evidently my voice was too powerful <laughs> I don't remember much and um, I sung and then I went down into the orchestra pit which they had and I played the piano I, I remember that really clear and uh, the other thing I remember is the Saturday morning pictures it was all cowboys you know all cowboy films for the youngsters it's true okay. and the um, then as you got older and you went as a teenager well it's it's a terrific place. Hey, Tempest are coming on Sunday down here. Down at Down and Way and along here, they come in droves to the you Splendid. Be marching along here. And if you were underage, you have to wait for somebody to take you in. You could go up to a man and you could say, please, would you take me in? And nobody would touch you. they just take yeah, the kids in and right, sit and down. Anybody. But you couldn't go in unless you were with an adult. adult. So you would be running up and down for a good half an hour please could you take me in, please could you take me in. Yeah. You've got somebody very nice and you'd say, oh, we mustn't sit with them, or we'd sit all quiet like this, <laughs> and probably a courting couple. <laughs> and then you started courting yourself, yourself. <laughs> and you used to feel sorry for the kids, oh, take them in, pay for them, <laughs> take them in. But it was lovely. Yeah, lovely Splendid yeah. was the best place that it was a shame it got knocked down. Shame everybody it. knew everybody, and if you'd seen these, this picture, you'd say, oh, well, where are we going tomorrow? We're going to see it again, because the atmosphere was so nice. Best, two best films I ever saw were Bette Davis' in Dark Victory, and I was Ice Cream Girl that week, and all the people, all the, all the adults were crying <laughs> their eyes out. <laughs> the whole audience, the whole adult audience, you could see handkerchiefs all over the cinema, and the other one was John Garfield, and they made me a criminal. One of them because it's, it's such a part of my life, such a part of my childhood and my youth. And my childhood and, and my youth on this estate were very, very happy days. Mm -hmm.